Hey, Pastor Eric Colser here. I hope that this sermon resource will bless you in addition to your participation in a local church. If you've been checking us out online and you're not a part of a church family, we'd love to meet you and get to know you in person. But again, we pray and hope that this blesses you and helps build you up to be sent out on Jesus's mission. Good morning and welcome. If I haven't met you yet, my name's Eric Colser. I serve as a pastor here at Gospel Collective Church. And again, glad that you're joining us in worship this morning. In fact, if you are new, very first Sunday, or maybe you've been here for a few weeks, uh, but we haven't been able to get to know you yet or uh, answer any questions you may have about our church, I do want to highlight these welcome cards should be right in front of you in the seats, uh, along with some pens. You can be able to grab one, fill out your name, phone, email, uh, anything that you want to maybe ask uh, that we can be able to answer um, and talk to you about, feel free to to uh, check any of those first, second steps. Uh, but then also we use these for prayer requests as well. And so any specific prayer requests for you as visitors or members, longtime attenders, uh, our church staff will pray for these uh, each and every Monday morning during our staff meeting. And again, we'll reply black. We'd love to get coffee with you, uh, meet with you to answer any questions as well. Just fill that out and put it in the uh, offering boxes uh, right by each one of the exits. Well, church, uh, we are starting a new series called Means of Grace. Means of Grace. This morning, we're going to be talking about particularly the Lord's Supper, but along with that, a couple other elements um, in the next few weeks. Uh, when we use that uh, terminology for this series, I want to briefly give a definition of each one. Uh, when we say means, remember the definition of means is an action or system by which a result is brought about or a method. When we say grace, a simple definition for that is a gift that God gives that we do not deserve, that we cannot earn, but God gives anyway. And then when we say church, simple, my own definition for church in just one brief definition is a gospel community built up to be sent out on gospel mission. However, Jonathan Lehman, who has written extensively on the church, on church discipline, um, uh, has says this uh, about the church. He says, a church is a group of Christians who assemble as an earthly uh, uh, embassy of Christ's heavenly kingdom to proclaim the good news and commands of Christ the King to affirm one another as his citizens through the ordinances and to display God's own holiness and love through a unified and diverse people in all the world following the teaching and example of elders. Again, love that definition, especially as he adds in the mention of ordinances, which is a means of grace within the church, what we're talking about in the next three weeks here. Ordinances, a definition by that from Greg Allison, my former uh, theology and historical theology professor at Southern Seminary, says this, an ordinance is a Christian rite associated with tangible elements. So for example, the water, the, the bread, the wine that is celebrated by the church of Jesus Christ. The term is closely associated with the word sacrament, which is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. And that's what we're going to be covering here over the next few weeks. Uh, what our church believes in his ordinances, but then also what we practice in community and polity as well. When I mention some of this, some of you may ask, like, how many ordinances are there? Well, that's actually a question that has actually divided many Christians and denominations. In fact, if you talk to Roman Catholics, the Roman Catholic Church has seven sacraments. Uh, that would include two that we would include, uh, baptism, uh, Lord's Supper, which they call Eucharist, uh, but then also they have confirmation, penance, anointing of the sick, holy orders, and matrimony. Uh, while they believe those are the seven ordinances of the church, there, is, there are many within the more orthodox churches uh, that would say there is a almost infinitive number of sacraments and ordinances. They would include other events of blessings, services, their prayer time, their song, their procession. Again, they have many different that they would use the same terminology called uh, as ordinances. And then most Protestant churches, they have two, uh, baptism and Lord's Supper. There are some Protestant churches that I know that actually has foot washing as an ordinance as well. Uh, to maybe the relief of many of you new people in here, we do not do that, okay? Although I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to judge, okay? Um, but we will be studying them along with community and, again, church governance or polity in the next three weeks. If we were Roman Catholic, this would be a 14-week series, all right? Seven for the seven sacraments and then seven to explain their church polity because it would take seven weeks to do that, okay? You guys, some didn't get that, but those who did, feel free to laugh. All right, anyways. 
so we'll be studying them. And, and with that being said, um, I do want you to ask two questions that we will answer for each means of grace within the church. As we talk about these ordinances and along with that community and polity, I want you asking, I want you discussing in your community groups over the next few weeks, why do we do these things? How does God use it? Why do we do it? How does God use it? The sacraments are what John Calvin once said, visible words. He was in fact echoing Augustine when saying it, but he said they are visible words where they work in the same way as God's word to an extent where when we receive them, we believe the gospel that they depict. And by believing, we receive the grace that they powerfully represent. And so with that in mind, they are important. Why do we do it? How does God use it? And so even when we first study and discuss this morning, the Lord's Supper, some of you have grown up maybe in a church or in a tradition denomination where it was done every single week, but maybe just a possible tag on at the end of the service. It was kind of like when you're walking out, hey, don't forget, grab your juice, grab your cup, and you know, get it on the way go. And so you're like walking out and you're like taking a, taking a little shot of Jesus' blood and then just, you know, like go walking right out. No explanation, no defining significance, importance of it. But it's done almost weekly. And some of you guys, you had done it like once, twice a year, once a quarter. And maybe the whole service explained it. That you knew it was something special about it, but you didn't know why. Again, why do we do this? How does God use this? And it's, let's just be honest, it's very, uh, not just significant, but it's unique for the Christian church. There's good reason for that. So first, let's discuss the roots of the Lord's Supper. The roots of the Lord's Supper comes from the Passover meal. I'm going to be quoting a lot of Exodus 12. Don't feel like you need to go there, uh, but I will be quoting from Exodus 12. And what I want to share with you guys as fast as possible is what a basic Passover meal would have looked like for God's people, for the Jews, for the Israelites, leading up to what Jesus even would have partook in, um, in his the Last Supper. Um, and so this is the history of where, again, what we have now comes out of this and what I'm going to explain with the Passover meal. And so before the Passover meal would even start, this would Jesus had done with his disciples with the, the Last Supper. We don't know if he did everything. I actually asked even somebody that has a lot of knowledge of this, uh, if he thinks that, that, uh, that Jesus went through everything of it. And again, we just don't know. Um, but this is what, before they even would start that, this is what they would do. They would first select the lamb. Of course, that lamb would be a one-year-old unblemished male lamb chosen for that meal by a member of the household that lamb was going to represent the lamb that what they are trying to honor, what they're trying to remember, what they're trying to celebrate once a year was the Passover, which is found in Exodus, which is when the Jews under the slavery of the Egyptians were told by God as uh, they were uh, asking to be let go. And, uh, and he'd go back on his word, go back and forth. And so, and God uh, giving this one final miracle to release them had said, anybody who believes, who trusts in me, who is of knowing them, the one true God, um, that you are to sacrifice this unblemished lamb, put the blood of that lamb on your doorpost. And on that night, if you did this, this shows that you are of me, faith, trust in me. And if not, your firstborn will be killed. And from that, everyone who believed in the one true God did that. And those who didn't, their firstborn was killed, including the Pharaoh who was holding God's people under slavery. And that was what was used for him to let them go. And in remembrance of that, in honor of that, they would do this Passover meal once a year along with a big celebration, a big feast along with that. So that lamb represented that. They would also, the day before the meal, have something called search for the leaven. Uh, usually in the evening before that meal was eaten, the paterfamilia led their family, that would be the head of the household, through the house by candlelight, and they would look in every nook, every cranny, every corner of the house for any leaven in the home. Okay? They'd get rid of all leaven in the home. No leaven was supposed to be in the home. When studying this, I actually found out that often Jews would sell their leaven to their Gentile neighbors only to buy it back eight days later, okay? Uh, they were like, hey, we, we got to get, get rid of this for the thing. So they would even sell it and then just buy it back a little bit later. But no leaven be in the home. 
and you'll see why in a little bit in the service. Uh, and at the end of the search, the father would say, all leaven that is in my possession, that which I have seen and that which I have not seen, be it null, and it is counted as the dust of the earth. And now the Passover meal starts. It would first start off as they would walk in and they would get a foot washing. Um, guests, family members enter the home to celebrate. A servant would often be there to wash their, their feet or the person who was out of anybody, everybody there uh, of the lowest class of people, which has a lot to do with with the significance of Jesus doing this to the disciples, of course. And so this was something that was rarely done for the Passover meal. Uh, the lowest person or the servant in the home would, would uh, wash their feet. And then after that was finished, they would partake of non-ritual wine. Uh, they would be given a cup and they'd be able to drink through the evening non-ritual wine that had no religious significance. Um, some of you non-Baptists, uh, some of you Baptists, I'm sorry, is getting very uncomfortable here, right? Um, then it would be first hand washing. Once all the guests arrived, they would perform a ritual hand washing that Jews had done before every single meal. Uh, they would come to the table and the table would be all set up four glasses for ritual wine. I'll get back to this, but they had four glasses. It was empty, but this was on the table. The cups that they had for the non-ritual was just by, by them in their hands. They'd have to put it on the floor next to them, but these were on the table set up. And get again back to that in just a moment. Um, it, sometimes they would be labeled, uh, but they'd have one plate. They'd have cutlery. They'd have a napkin. They'd have several candles on the table. Sometimes they'd have seating labels in place for each name person there. Then they'd have the unleavened bread, vegetables, and then vinegar, uh, the carpus, will all be put on the table. And then they would sit down. And when I say sit down, I'm talking about like they wouldn't just really sit down, like Indian style. This was like relaxing lounging, okay? It was a low table. And in the ancient Near Eastern custom, this was like total relaxation. I'm talking about, no joke, pillows. And you're like, mm, okay, like getting comfortable, okay? It is, it is, uh, it, it was showing that like, hey, this is an important time, but this is going to be like, we're not rushing this. This is, we're going to be here. We're going to relax. All right. So take off your shoes. They were just washed uh, your feet and come and relax around the table. And once they did that um, and know that the seating at Passover was also assigned, beginning with the head of the, the family at one end. And then guests are, to, guests are to wrap around the table, either from oldest to youngest or most important to least important. Um, and sometimes, again, their names would be placed on there. But then you would sit down and as they would start the meal, the first cup uh, would be lifted. Uh, the first, the four ritual cups. Uh, the Mishnah says that even the poorest man in Israel must drink the four ritual cups, um, even if it meant selling all of their possessions. And so as that first cup was lifted, a prayer was uttered over that cup. The first four verbs of Exodus 6, 6 through 7. Um, and as they were seating, seated casually, that first prayer would go something like this. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of of the vine. And you, O Lord, our God, have given us festival days for joy, this feast of the unleavened bread, the time of our deliverance and remembrance of the departure from Egypt. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and enabled us to enjoy this season. And then that prayer of the cups called the Kiddush Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has created the fruit of the vine. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and enabled us to enjoy this season. After this prayer, that first cup of ritual wine is poured, and the first part of Exodus 6, 6 through 7 is recited by the Father. And he said, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Once he said that, the wine now can be drunk. After that first cup, the, the ritual wine, the first cup was, was drunk. Um, they can now drink the non-ritual wine until the second cup is served. Um, uh, when that second cup is served, before drinking it, uh, they would partake in something called the carpus. This is the bitter herbs and a first dipping into it. The head of the home would dip bitter herbs, traditional lettuce or celery, into salt water or vinegar. And as they he would dip the herbs together with the chief guests of honor, they would pass them to the other people all, all of the table. Um, and as they partake in that, um, all other food would be removed from the table. Um, this would heighten the interest of the evening, prompting the questions from the youngest son in a moment here. Um, then when they were finished, they would take the second cup and they would pour the wine into the second ritual cup. Once they would do that, the youngest son or the one who would represent the least significant in the household would ask these questions. They'd say, why is this night different from all other nights? 
On all other nights, we eat leavened or unleavened bread, but this night only unleavened bread. On all other nights, we eat all kinds of herbs, but this night only bitter herbs. Why do we dip the herbs twice? On all other nights, we eat meat roasted, stewed or boiled, but on this night, why only roasted meat? And so when the youngest would say this, the father the, the, uh, would answer by recounting the history of Israel. He would go from Abraham to Moses to the giving of the law to, again, significance of the Passover. Once he explains the history of Israel, all food and wine is returned to the table, including the lamb that I'd mentioned at the beginning. And now the father explains that significance of that lamb, the unblemished lamb, how it was sacrificed um, in the Passover, what it represented, the bitter herbs, again, the unleavened bread. After he would explain that, they would then sing the first half of Psalm 113, 114. From there, they would pray over now that second cup that has been poured, but they haven't been drank, drunk yet. Yeah, the prayer would be, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. Then they would read Exodus 6, 6b, I will deliver you from their bondage. From there, they would have a second hand washing. This hand washing would be done out of respect for the unleavened bread that is about to eat. Um, the, again, lamb uh, uh, cho chosen with the vegetables, and then two of the unleavened bread uh, wafers are then served. And then the father would pray a prayer over that unleavened bread. He would say, Blessed O you, O Lord God our King, King of the universe who brings forth bread from the earth, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to eat unleavened bread. From there he would break the bread. Now, this is significant because of when Jesus had done it. Again, I don't know if he went through all of these things with the disciples. All four gospel accounts has additional words and conversation and dialogue, very important dialogue during that meal. Uh, so we don't know if he went through everything or if they were kind of distracted with some of the stuff that he was saying, like, now this is my body. Like, hmm? you know, like he said some pretty, pretty bold things at that meal for them to say, Something's different here, right? We'll get to that in the Last Supper. But this is where, when the breaking the bread, he had said his own, what we practice today. The host would break the guest of honor's bread. They would then dip it together um, into the, the vinegar um, uh, and the bitter herbs. The guest, in turn, would break his neighbor's bread, and they would dip it together and so on down the line. And now the meal may be eaten. As they eat, after drinking that second cup of wine, any wine that had already been drunk may now be drunk non-ritually. And so, again, they had time of fellowship, time of community. Um, then the third cup comes into play. The third cup uh, with prayer and consumption, and that after that meal that they would eat, the third cup is now poured. The last of the unleavened bread wafers is blessed, broken, and eaten. What would be prayed would be, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to eat unleavened bread. All participants are then to recite the post-mill grace together and then the prayer over the wine, which, similar to what I had said, the name of the Lord be blessed from now until eternity. Let us bless him of whose gifts we have partaken. Blessed be our God of whose gifts we have partaken. And by whose goodness we exist, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. After praying that over that third cup, the father recites the third verb from Exodus 6, 6. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then that third cup of wine is drunk. Now, after that third cup, there is no non-ritual wine that can be drunk after there. Some of you guys may be thinking, well, by that time, yeah, they don't need to be drinking any more additional wine by that time, okay? But after that third cup, done with the non-traditional wine. Fourth cup now is the final one that is poured. That is poured and then blessed by all. They say in unison, blessed are you, O Lord, our King, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. Then the Father recites the last and fourth verb from Exodus 6, 6 through 7 which reads, then I will take you as my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And then they would close this time together singing Psalms 115 to 118. 
as a final closing hymn. They would sing those things together. That, my friends, that church family is what leading up to the Last Supper they did each year with great significance. Now, of course, many guys know, and we'll read in a moment here, when Jesus partook in this, in the Last Supper, he then gave to us or instituted the Lord's Supper. Um, this is found on all four gospel accounts. Some of you guys know that John will say something, maybe the other three accounts. Sometimes it will be in Matthew, Mark, not Luke, John. Uh, this was recorded and written for all four gospel accounts. I will be reading specifically from Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 29. Feel free to open up your Bibles there. If not, it will be on the screens to the left and right of me. So this is the tradition. This is important. This is what Jesus would have done every year. And now in his 33rd year of age, he comes in of course, uh, uh, the untriumphal uh, um, um, recognition on the donkey, uh, that act actually even had significance as that fell on Palm Monday. Um, as many believe, that was him presenting himself as that unblemished sacrificial lamb for us. So he comes in on that day, um, and he tells, as we see in verse 17, his disciples to prepare for this meal. Read with me Matthew chapter 26 to see uh, the leading up to this and what was change what is different. Verse 17, God's word says this. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. Verse 20. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. So this is literally, like I said, relaxing. They're all the, having the, the Passover meal. Um, and so he's there. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now this isn't like the most comfortable table talk right here, right? Okay. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. Which leads on to a couple quick things. I'm going to go off on rabbit trails. I don't have time for this. Um, Judas was placed very close to him in significance and importance. Now, remember when I said of dipping of the, in, into the bitter and everything? Um, that's, that's what happened here. The one who followed right, right, right after him. And so he answered, the one who dipped in the dish with me will betray me. The son of man goes as is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Verse 25, Judas, who would betray him, answered, is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, you have said so. So already there's some things that are different than the traditional Passover meal going on here. Verse 25 now, 26, I'm sorry, now as they were eating, Jesus, remember in that ceremony, um, the part in between, the, I think the second, third cup or third or fourth, he took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. In Luke's account, he says, eat this or do this in remembrance of me. So now, again, everything's thrown out the window when saying, this is my body. This is mine. And every time you are to eat it, every time you do it, you are to remember me because of what is going to happen later. Then, verse 27, he took the cup. And as he took that cup, when he had given thanks, prayed over it, like I prayed for the fruit of the vine, and it's good within it. He gave it to them. He says, now drink this, all of you. And when you do this, remember, this is the blood of, my, of the covenant, which is now being poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, again, all other gospel accounts, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, it is the same story. Um, some different personalities, views with it, but same story. But they knew something was different here. 
Jesus here, what we know now, institutes what the church is to continually practice today in place of what is the root of the Lord's Supper, the Passover meal. He symbolically associates the bread and the cup, which would soon be broken, and his blood, which would soon be shed. That blood now is the blood of the covenant, he says. The new covenant that Jesus would institute through what will happen in the death and resurrection of Christ. And as the Passover meal was served as a foundational meal of the old covenant, taking place on the brink of the foundational acting, I mean, I'm sorry, saving act of the new covenant. The Lord's Supper that we have now today is what represents what he would achieve on the cross and what we are to remember. Never, ever forget what it offers and what it ushers in. For that Passover meal was served as a reminder of the redemption that the Lord achieved for his people and bringing them out of the bondage of Egypt. We now have the Lord's Supper today where it is a powerful reminder of the redemption that the Lord Jesus achieved for his people, releasing us from slavery to sin. This meal is then, again, foundational and an enduring symbol of that new covenant in Christ. And as Jesus said, and the Apostle Paul, we're going to read here in just a moment, will say, it shows the importance of not only what we are doing, but how we are to be doing this often. So this is the account of when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper for us as a church in the New Covenant. But then we have Paul's instruction. And these are the only things we're going to see in the scriptures about this. What's heavily debated and divided over and so many, like this is all we have, you guys, all right? So we have Jesus, what he did and what's instituted, but then we have what we're going to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 34. This shows the importance of the Lord's Supper, Paul's instruction for the church. Some of you may ask, how, why is this important? Well, it is, as we're going to see here from Paul, because we can make a mockery of the gospel by participating in it with wrong motives and unrepentant hearts. In fact, reading the very beginning of it, verse 17 through 22, you see divisions and factions going on. You see favoritism and partiality, people getting drunk off the wine. And so he's showing this should not be treated in this way. Look at verse 17. God's word says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you came together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. And as I had mentioned when preaching this passage a year and a half ago when we went through the book of 1 Corinthians, I always laugh when I see the first word of verse 22. What? Like, this is not like a recorded like, sermon of his, okay? Like, he is writing this to them, and he doesn't even like, have a question mark. It is an exclamation point, like, what? Okay? Like, what are you guys doing right there? I, I shared, I felt similar early on in COVID when every church had to, you know, not know what was going on and, and most doing what they can be able to do. And so encouraging people to take Lord's Supper in their own homes while watching the services. And I remember reading about and seeing so many other churches. I'm not going to name names and I didn't see many from this area, but other churches like, and as you partake in Lord's Supper today, go and just grab a, go, you don't need the bread, go grab the fruit snacks. Go grab a beer or go grab a, 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 a L8 or something for you to be. I'm like, that's how I felt right there. Paul, what? No question mark, exclamation point. Like, what are you doing? Okay. And that wasn't even in comparison to this. So he says, do you not, verse 22, have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God, humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. And here, starting with verse 23, is what we see repeated from what Jesus had instituted and said, the beautiful picture of the gospel in the Lord's Supper. As Paul repeats what we are to remember from what Jesus said when continuing this sacrament, verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took that bread. And when he took it, he gave thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this or eat this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way also he took that cup after supper, saying, This cup is now the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, which is important. I'll come back to later on. Now, verse 27 to 34, where we just got done reading the beauty of the gospel in it, we see the ramifications and consequences of either rejecting or receiving the gospel that was just illustrated, verses 23 through 26. Verse 27, we see condemnation and guilt when not participating in the Lord's Supper out of a response of repentance for sin when reflecting on what it represents, the gospel. Look what he says, verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. This is why we see in the next couple verses the importance of examining yourself whenever you participate in it and when you're reflecting on the gospel that it portrays. Look at verse 28. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why I'm going to be honest with you. As a church, we have never treated it as the grab-and-go type that we are going to take some time for you on your own to take some time with the Lord, examining yourself in prayer, in conversation with the Lord, reminding what this represents. And this is why. Look what he says. Here's actual consequences of disobedience being unrepentant. Verse 30. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. So we do not want any 911 phone calls this morning, okay? Like, we want to take this with the seriousness of what the Apostle Paul says, because there's consequences, not because of eating, drinking, but motives do matter, and because of what it represents, and how we respond to what it represents, rejecting the gospel instead of receiving. And if you're not ready or willing to receive, don't make a mockery of this. It's why I've shared with many of you before. There's been times, even as pastor, I'll never forget the time when I served as a student pastor and I did not partake in the Lord's Supper because I knew I had sin that I couldn't just confess and repent with the Lord. Of course, I could have at the time, but I knew I had to make a certain wrong right with a person. I had to talk to that person and ask for forgiveness. And so I did not partake in it until I could be able to do that first. And as I did not partake in it, and it was a church that had passed it around, one of my older high school students came up and said, I saw you didn't take the Lord's Supper. Is everything okay? And they even said something was like, are you like questioning your salvation? <laughs> like they're asking like if I'm a Christian. It was like, yes, but I just need to have, I need to make right with that person with the Lord before I can do it. That's how we treat it. But now, you see, starting with verse 31, God's discipline, grace, and fruit when responding how we should when reflecting on the gospel with repentance and faith. Verse 31, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Verse 33, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. He's trying to correct the things that they were doing wrong and in sin, wrong motives at that time in the Corinthian church. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things. I will give directions when I come. So we see here in chapter 11, verse 17 to 34, Paul gives some very specific instructions to show the importance of this ordinance and how we are to treat it because of what it represents. This is what we have in the scripture of the Lord's Supper. This is what every church is to try to do their best, knowing it's an open issue, second, third tier, not first gospel issue, but that we are to take it serious. We are to do it regularly. Many, of course, differ on what that means. And I want to share with you some of those differences. Um, Jesus' words of institution makes it clear that the mill serves as a symbol of that new covenant and where to remember his death. However, one differing opinion view of this is the nature of Jesus' presence at the supper that's disputed. In fact, when Jesus says that the bread is my body and that the cup is my blood of the covenant, some may ask, what does he exactly mean by that? In fact, when the Apostle Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians, speaking of the spiritual danger of participating in idolatrous feasts, 
he draws a parallel to the significance of participating in the Lord's Supper. We read it in our liturgy this morning. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ, he says? The body that we break, the bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 10, 16. So some should ask, what sense is this a participation in the body and blood of Christ? There's four differing views of the nature of the supper and Jesus' presence in it. I want to share. This is a combination of myself, Greg Allison, the uh, uh, historical theology professor I mentioned from Southern Seminary, and a pastor by the name of Jonathan Griffiths. First view of this is transubstantiation. This is the largely Roman Catholic view. This is held by, again, majority, most Roman Catholics, some others, that believe in the Mass, the elements, the body and the blood of Christ is being administered by the priests. The priests At the sacrament of the Eucharist, as that is administered, though the bread still looks, smil smells, fills, and tastes like bread, its substance has been changed through a blessing of that priest into the actual body of Christ. Similarly, though the wine still smells, looks, tastes like wine, its substance has literally been changed to the blood of Christ by the priest in a ceremony right before the Mass. And because of this, it is one of the means of salvation. When I say means of grace, I don't mean that grace being salvific in this series for us. For them, that is a means of salvation along with the other sacraments in the Roman Catholic Church. We, I say for obvious, but maybe, again, you're new visiting, we do not believe this view. We do not believe this is Jesus' literal body and blood and that we need to take this in order for us in a part of our salvation. It's, it's why this is significant for the Roman Catholic Church, though. I don't know if you have read books or seen movies or read through history, along with Roman Catholicism like spreading, like they need the elements along with the other things because it's a part of their salvation. One of my favorite movies by Martin Scorsese is a movie called Silence about uh, persecuted uh, Jesuit uh, Christians, which they believe these elements, again, was a part of, of Christ. And so when these missionaries came after a long, long time, decades of no priests, one of the first things they said, one of the first things they said is, do you have the elements to give us? Because they knew it was part of in their theology, salvation. Now, in the Reformation, the Roman Catholic doctrine of this was rejected. Um, it was rejected uh, for, for, for most part, although there was heavy questioning on it, but it was on three key grounds. Jesus is physically now present in heaven, and to suggest that his physical body can be present in multiple locations, like a physical body, um, would, would undermine his true humanity. Uh, number two, the worshipful adoration of the elements that takes place, uh, where this often becomes idolatrous. Um, and then third, this undermines the finality and sufficiency of his work at the cross, because that and that alone is where we can be able to find salvation. Our means is repentance through faith, um, but that work is done in the cross. There is not an additional work that's being done weekly, monthly, quarterly in any other church. So that's the first view. Second view would be consubstantiation. This is a largely Lutheran view. This was held by Martin Luther, um, although he would not use that label, and still generally held by many Lutherans today. Luther wished to correct the errors of the Roman Catholic view while still taking seriously both Jesus' identification of his body and blood with the elements and the idea that he was truly present at the supper. So Luther's solution was to say that although the bread and wine did not literally become the body and blood of Christ, Jesus is nonetheless spiritually present in under and through the elements. That's where that word con comes in consubstantiation. Con means with in Latin. Thus, there in a real sense, Jesus is present at the supper, even if there is no change in the substance of the elements themselves. Some of you guys have confused faces. I'm going to be honest. This is coming from one who has his master's in seminary and studies this because I take this serious. I'm just as confused as you, okay? Like, I, I think he was trying to hold on to some certain things. Uh, he was like, man, I've reformed a lot of these things. <laughs> I'm like the, the black sheep right here, okay? He was like, this one, I'll, I'll try to have a little bit of both, okay? Um, but it doesn't make sense to me uh, to be able to have both in that way. We don't practice, believe, communicate this as a church. Third view is memorial. This would be a largely Baptist view. This view is particularly associated with Swiss reformer Zwingli 
and is held by, again, majority many Baptists. Zwingli insisted that Jesus' statement that the bread is his body and the wine is his blood should be taken figuratively, not in any type of way, literally. The sacrifice of Jesus at the cross is a complete once for all, and so the supper is a pictorial reminder, a memorial. Although Christ is always present with his people, he is not specially present at the supper. And so this view especially stands against those first two views that I had mentioned. Very popular, I'd probably say most popular view around Protestant churches of today, okay? And where many of you guys probably do fall as well. Fourth view is spiritual presence. This is where, I'll be honest, where I lean personally, spiritually present. It's largely Presbyterian view. Moving beyond the memorial view, John Calvin communicated the most about this. Uh, this is maintaining that the bread and wine are symbols. They're certainly symbols, but they are not empty symbols. Although Memorial would never say that they are empty symbols as well. But this view is that they render what they symbolize. Basically, John Calvin rejected both the idea of a physical change to the bread and wine and the idea of just, just a picture or a memorial. That at the supper... Jesus Christ is present spiritually in a special way, but is not present physically, and that there is true spiritual communion that takes place between the Lord and his church as it is celebrated. Again, by no means salvific or anything of the sort, but there is a mystery and, again, a presence of not in the elements, but when we do this together as community in unity. And I do believe that. I believe it's important for that reason. In fact, that word is, it retains a symbolic, not literal meaning, but at the same time, there is a true sharing in Christ that takes place. A sharing that includes participation with Christ, with church unity, and in sanctification. I believe any and every time we partake in this because of what it represents, what is being communicated, what we're doing in that time of confession and repentance, and then what we are ushering in, as Jesus had said, each time we do this, and then what it represents with unity. It is, like I said, more than just memorial, but no way salvific, but there is a presence of unity that is unique. So those are the differing views of the, uh, at least presence of Christ in there. Next question would be the regularity of the Lord's Supper. The scriptures are not clear about this, how often the Lord's Supper ought to be celebrated. Jesus himself gave no direction on the matter, nor did the Apostle Paul. In fact, one of the few things we have in God's word about that is from Luke in the book of Acts, where it says in chapter 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Luke was describing his seven-day visit um, to a city in Asia Minor, and that passage does imply that the breaking of bread was not an unusual occurrence, but the normal practice of the Christians in that city. So we know it was happening regularly. There's also several extra biblical sources that report more explicitly that the early church celebrated the Lord's Supper weekly or whenever it met for worship. That includes the late first century Didache, uh, the teaching of the 12 apostles, the first apology of Justin Martyr, which was written in the middle of the second century, and the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus, which was written around AD 200, and it's the oldest surviving Christian liturgy. In fact, that author documents the normal worship service in Rome, and this was included. Each time they met, they participated in the Lord's Supper. What we know is from then to now, as early about the fourth century, laity had already begun to participate in the supper with decreasing frequency. It started not happening as often as it did in the early church. There was a resurgence of more regular occurring Lord's Supper with the Reformation in the 1500s. By that time, the priests were doing it weekly while most watched or those who had higher political or religious positions could take it more regularly. But the average layperson only did it about one to three times a year. And so, as explained above, almost all reformers went away from the view of Lord's Supper transubstantiation. And while differing on some things, they almost all agreed we should be doing this more regularly. And they pushed it that way. As they pushed it that way, it did become more common throughout the church, again, to happen more regularly. My opinion, I don't have stats to, 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 uh, uh, to, to prove this, but I feel like probably just in the last 100, 150 years, it's become 
less regular, again, at least in Western culture, United States. I think it's because of the memorial view, which again, I don't disagree with that view. I think it's a good view, but because within that, I think there's, this is what it just represents. And so it hasn't done, it hasn't been as significant, I would say, uh, with that. This is what we communicate at our 101 class and what we believe about this. Communion, the Lord's Supper, we partake of the Lord's Supper on a semi-quarterly basis, so we do it once every two months. We do not affirm the idea of the real presence of the Eucharist, but we do not hold a merely symbolic interpretation of this ordinance. Again, this is where many of you guys is more memorial in that way, but we communicate of why we do it and what we communicate when we say it, because we do believe there is unity in the body that is represented and what we are, as Jesus had said, ushering in the kingdom. Um, and so that's why we communicate that way. We allow for all Christians Christians, regardless of membership, denomination, or baptismal status, to partake of the Lord's Supper, and every individual will be accountable for how he or she partakes of this ordinance, as Paul teaches in his first letter to the Corinthians. I will also share with you guys that our elders are praying, studying, and considering to partake in the Lord's Supper more often than what we do, whether that's weekly or once a month, but we are praying through those things as well, believing, knowing it is Again, open hand issue. Churches can be able to do that once a quarter, once a year. Um, but we want to pray about doing it a little bit more regularly based off what we're reading and studying. Um, and we don't know, but, but that'll come later. Now, as I conclude, I want to share, like I had asked in the very beginning, why do we do it and how does God use it? How is the Lord's Supper a means of grace for the church? Four quick things. Number one, to symbolize the new covenant. What Jesus said and why it has changed from the past over mill and what it represents with what we have in him. Number two, to visibly remember and respond to the gospel. That each time we partake in this, we are to look back with gratitude to Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. We are also to confess and repent of sin. That it's, moment, it's an opportunity in time that in repentance, once again, we are thankful for such forgiveness, but we are to make sure, and God gives us a time to make sure that we are not just going through the motions and that we are to respond accordingly to what he did for us on the cross. We are to examine ourselves. But it also should be done out of great joy that as we do that individually, but also together, we are thankful again for what he has given us in the church body. One thing I love about our church is we've had long tradition to do this with family and or friends. In fact, just a moment ago, our kids uh, walked in and uh, before we partake in this, many parents uh, are gonna be with their kids and they have opportunity to do that as family together. And they have opportunity if their kids aren't believers to explain what this means, why they can't partake in it. And not of like, hey, we're in, you're out. But in a way of saying our prayer, our hope is that when you receive this, you will partake in this because it's only, it's a cracker and juice, but what it means and what it represents heart, soul, eternity wise, this is what we pray and hope and share to you right now. I love, love the opportunity to visibly remember and respond to the gospel. Three, to point to the community and unity of a redeemed people gathered at his table. We are to look around and remember that we are a church family with whom we serve and share this supper with. That it's something we do as we come together and discern the body of Christ as we eat. That it should be significant that as we share this meal as a community, that we don't just think of it and look at it as partaking of it individually unless needed for certain circumstances or certain seasons. That's why COVID was tough for me. To, to, but again, it was needed at the time. There's people who are shut-ins, people who are sick, needed at that time. But this is to represent us united together. That sharing the one bread together, again, is a sign, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 17, of our fundamental unity. Along with this, this is why it's also important as it's used in church discipline. That if somebody's not a member in good standing or an unbeliever, again, that they do not partake in this until repentance, until restoration in those ways. It points to the community unity of remained people gathered at the table. Last of all, it is to anticipate the messianic banquet yet to come. 
Finally, we look forward to the day when we partake in this to when Jesus will return. That the celebration of supper serves as a proclamation of Jesus' death while in which we anticipate his return. And that even Jesus himself who instituted it, he ate it in anticipation of the future as he said in verse 29 to Matthew 26. That the ultimate outworking of God's salvation plan it is also associated with the promise of the great banquet that we will read in concluding liturgy this morning and that the Lord's Supper serves as a foretaste of that great banquet where we will be with our husband Christ as the bride, the church, and celebrating and joyfully thanking, eating, drinking, saying, you have ended sin, Satan, suffering once and for all. We usher and remember that hope when we partake in this. It should come with as much joy as it does with the soberness of it. And to conclude, it is one of the most powerful illustrations of the gospel. That's why Bobby Jameson in his book, Understanding the Lord's Supper, says this. There's a gorgeous simplicity to God's design for the church. What does it take to make a church? Gospel preaching that creates gospel people who participate in gospel ordinances, similar to what Jonathan Lehman said. The church is the shape into which the gospel and its ordinances form God's people. And as he says, baptism binds one to many, and the Lord's Supper binds many into one. Baptism and the Lord's Supper inscribe the gospel into the very shape and structure of the church. What makes many one are the signs of the gospel. And when Christians come together to form a church, they aren't moving beyond the gospel, but deeper into it. My prayer for you is that whether it's the Lord's Supper, baptism, what's represented there, that you will be moved deeper into the gospel. So with that said, let me give a few quick instructions for this. Um, first time visiting, or just as a reminder, we have a table to the left and right up, up on the front right here. We also have a table in the back with a gluten-free option um, if you need that or prefer that. That when you are ready, you can move toward the tables, either in the front or back and through the middle aisles, and walk back in the aisles by the windows. As you do that, you can take the bread, take the cup, and either go back to your seat or you can go somewhere in the sanctuary and make an altar uh, in this room uh, to spend some time with the Lord. We want to encourage you to do this as a family or if you feel led to with others. Maybe that's people in your community group, people you came with. Uh, maybe that's a discipler. Um, parents uh, want to encourage you. Spiritually lead your kids in this time, asking them if they understand or want to confess, repent of anything at a time of prayer and lead them into what Jesus said. Eat this in remembrance of me. Drink this in remembrance of me. What it represents is the forgiveness of sins. You don't have to explain new covenant and everything else, but share the gospel. Share the gospel with to them. Pray for them. That kids are in the back, and as soon as we're finished, they're going to be coming to join you. And again, you can partake in that with them. Explain that to them. But before doing any of that, let me ask you, as what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, examine yourself at your seat. Spend some time in prayer and confession and repentance, what's needed, and do not do what he warns. Make a mockery of what's represented in the table, the gospel. That as he mentioned, it's better for you even to wait if you're not ready to repent because of the consequences. And last of all, if you are not a believer, if you're not a Christian, I know this means nothing to you. Maybe it's kind of interesting to learn here the history of some of those things or why we do it. Even learning history, why in the early church they were accused of being cannibals because of the Jesus' blood and body and while we're eating and drinking it. You know, kind of cool history lesson maybe for you. But let me share that. Although maybe you haven't thought much about it today, even if you grew up in a faith tradition, and you've just done it regularly, routinely, traditionally, but if for whatever reason God is speaking to your heart, to your soul right now, and there's something more. And it's not because of the elements, because of what it represents. I do want to ask you to spend some time at your seat talking to the Lord about that. I do ask you to consider talking to the Lord and asking, are you a sinner in need of a Savior? 
Because it's not through this drink and bread that saves you or anyone else in here. It is through what it represents. Listen, there is a God and there is a Jesus. You cannot deny a historical figure of a man who came to this earth who said he was God and changed the world after that fulfilled the prophecies that he did, that fulfilled everything that was represented in that Passover meal like he did to take away your sins and reconcile you back to the God that created you for him. And he does that out of great, great grace and love for you, displayed ultimately in what that bread represents as his body was broken for you on the cross, for what that drink represents, his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And that you don't have to do anything, be good to receive that, but it is in their heart of hearts and your soul saying, I am that sinner. Jesus, you are that savior by what you did in the cross, what you accomplished in the resurrection only God can do, rising from the dead. And that my heart of hearts and my soul. I repent of my sins. I give you my life and I have faith that you are that savior and that you cry out to him in prayer, telling him to make you anew. And I encourage you and what that represents, if it's not now the tradition, what you maybe grew up with, what you have heard of, what you thought, but what it represents is you need this, that you ask him to be your Lord and savior. And then you partake in it with what we just described, that joy. Because now you have a church body. Now you have a God that's going to be with you every step of the way. In your own time, will you respond to what this represents in the gospel? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you so much, Lord, for these visible words that you've given us as gifts of grace to powerfully represent what we need from you, what we have from you, what others will receive in you. God, I pray, Lord, that as we take this time, even in prayer and reflection, as Christians, believers, united in the body, that we can individually confess, repent of some of those sins, reminding, being reminded and thankful for the continual opportunity to be forgiven and restored. And that, again, if there's anybody here that needs to pass from death to life, from lost to found, from darkness into light, and that's because of what's represented here in the gospel, Lord, that they will do it now. God, I thank you for a united church and the reminder of that, that we know, although not perfect, when we're in community and unity with each other, we can help each other and continue your mission. Let that be another reminder today as we also anticipate you returning. We thank you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.